it turns out uh, that people hardly ever act on a single warning, to use the advertising term, impression. It usually takes multiple corroborating impressions. The best you can hope for with a single delivery system is to get people's attention. But if you don't back it up with corroboration, people will tend to find reasons to discount the warning system. So one of the, the first things is this is not a matter of finding one magic bullet and applying it, but rather of creating a coordinated uh, communication effort on a very short time frame. Uh, the other really crucial finding that I wanted to highlight with you is that there tends to be a lot of uh, uh, discussion of, uh, uh, well, two terms. Panic is one and the other is cry wolf. And it turns out that both of those are informed by a great deal of mythology. Uh, panic is hardly ever a problem. We understand panic pretty well, and in fact, if you like, when we get into q and A, I'll be happy to tell any of you who are uh, uh, concerned about such things precisely how to start a panic. If you need to start a panic, I can tell you precisely what you need to do. Uh, the important thing is that that particular set of circumstances generally does not arise in warning contexts. So panic isn't nearly the issue uh, that uh, I'm afraid it's made out to be. Neither is the so-called cry wolf syndrome, but uh, I'll save that for later. Um, talking about the technology level, you know, how are we going to coordinate those? You know, given that we know from the social science that we need to coordinate multiple warning delivery systems, how can we do that? Well, it turns out that uh, there are some uh, fairly mature now uh, methods available for doing that. There's an international uh, data standard called the Common Alerting Protocol that most warning systems can now accept as an input, which means you can generate one master warning document. I call it sort of the platonic ideal of the warning, and then push that to multiple delivery systems in parallel, and they will all process it. Uh, uh, this is, of course, you know, to use the buzzword of the decade, an interoperability technology. And like all interoperability technologies, it has a benefit that goes right to the bottom line, purely aside from the improvement in the quality of service. And that is that by having an interoperability layer into which you can plug and from which you can unplug technologies over time, you future-proof your decisions and you can lower the level of risk associated uh, with making these choices. Uh, if a system turns out not to be effective anymore, you can fire it. If a new system comes along, you can add it in without having to refactor the whole uh, design of the system. This is really important stuff that uh, your management folks, I, I hope will uh, respond to. Uh, finally, uh, frequently we get into uh, questions of, of protocol and even of jurisdiction uh, that have to do with uh, where notification fits within uh, public information, uh, public relations, uh, law enforcement, various other uh, aspects of, of uh, campus communications. Uh, a simple tool that uh, I've found helps me unpack some of those problems is uh, how many here were either boy or girl scouts at one time? Any? A few? Okay. So, and I imagine that most of you, whether you were scouts or not, were familiar with the, uh, the, the traditional fire triangle. You know, you have the, the fuel and, and the oxygen and the heat. If you break any part of that triangle, the fire goes out. I'd ask you to uh, imagine a different triangle that has as its three sides the aspect of alerting, the aspect of informing, and the aspect of reassuring. And as a mnemonic, you can call that the AIR model. Now, the interesting thing about that triangle is that it is a triangle that cannot be broken. Every act of communication has some elements, not always in the same proportions, but some of each of those uh, three aspects. And if you can identify that notification, which is largely a matter of alerting, redirecting people's attention budgets, has to be followed up by more detailed information and generally also requires a degree of sort of affective, uh, emotional level communication. You know, why do we trot out our elected officials and chancellors and such during an emergency? Because they are especially authoritative on the details? Uh, respectfully, clearly not. Uh, we do it because they provide a reassurance message that the system is still working and all's right with the world. That's their piece. So there actually is harmony that can be found among 
uh, the uh, first responders who may be responsible for uh, drawing people's attention to an emergent situation uh, on very short notice. The public information people who are concerned with uh, providing more detailed information to a number of audiences and uh, the uh, policy level people who are largely uh, uh, there in to uh, sort of personify and embody uh, the uh, resilience of the campus community. Uh, that's what I put on my slides and then of course we've been sitting around chatting for half an hour so various other points uh, uh, have occurred and I'm sure you'll have questions as well, but that's sort of all I had. So, Marissa, shall I just ask you up, or Keith, did you want to? Oh, please. Be in your locker. Yeah, make oh, one Peter. All right, that was wonderful, and I absolutely see why you are known as the godfather of emergency notification systems. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I am so excited to introduce to you a wonderful supporter and partner of emergency preparedness and our host here today. She really wanted to get by, and thank you for coming here. Uh, Dr. Jamila Moore is the new president of Los Angeles City College a former vice chancellor from Sacramento, and again, a wonderful partner in which preparedness. Thanks, Dr. Moore. Thank you, Peter. I just wanted to welcome all of you. I see some familiar faces out there. Wanted to say hello, uh, and thank you for coming out. This, of course, is a very important topic, uh, disaster preparedness. I want to thank all of our speakers for coming out to LA City College today. I know you're all very, very busy people, but I know this information is very valuable. I also want to thank all the staff here on campus that have worked so hard in putting this together. Uh, most of you are used to seeing Dr. Arvizu, our uh, associate VP. He, unfortunately, has the flu, so uh, he's not with us today, but uh, we are looking forward to him having a speedy recovery. And uh, I wish I could stay with you, but I'm like many others, crossing my fingers that we're going to have a state budget soon as we work through our budget negotiations downtown. <laughs> but I just wanted to come by and say hello and thank all of you for coming out to City College and giving your valuable time to us today. I know that you'll have very successful discussions, and if there's anything that we can do, please let us know, and we welcome you back to City College anytime. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And I'd like to provide a little glimpse into one activity that your neighbor to the south is doing, and that's in regards to uh, dependable partnerships and engaging in an ongoing dialogue where it's transparent and local government can interact with campus emergency managers, administrators, and security personnel on an ongoing basis. So what I want to talk about is just one of my projects at the County Office of Emergency Services. As you all know, and probably within your own campuses did so in the wake of the Virginia Tech tragedy in April 2007, were reviewed your campus emergency operations procedures, took a look at your existing technology, and as you know, across the nation, numerous task forces, panels, and committees were established to review current emergency notification systems on campuses, whether it be private, state, local, community colleges, and so on. And as you also probably are aware, that the College Opportunity and Affordability Act of 2007 had initially stated that campuses must provide notification in a quote unquote timely manner to the campus community. And just recently, I've been following this bill, and it had passed on February 7th of this year that now has major implications and changes to the Clery Act that campuses must now, instead of a timely manner, which could be interpreted many different ways, are have to, are mandated to notify students within 30 minutes of an incident on campus, whether this be a regional incident or maybe a smaller, you know, just isolated incident which occurs on your own campus. But that legislation has changed and its implications, I'm sure, will have an effect for most of you. So what we did in our county is established a one-day forum. We called it Creating Partnerships That Work. We realized that we did not know many of you as far as the local government. We didn't know who our counterparts were on our local colleges, universities, and we wanted to have a partnership so we knew who to call if things were occurring and we needed information and vice, ver vice versa. If an incident was becoming a regional incident, we wanted to ensure that our colleagues on the campuses who are protecting the students 24-7 and faculty and staff knew who to call at the county level if they needed additional information. So let me just review. I want to make sure I get everything. Um, essentially, on that first day, we, our selection